Violence erupts across the Serbian capital after a clash with police in front of the parliamentary building. Evidence emerges that the former mayor of Seoul, South Korea, possibly committed suicide, and a series of events describing the rise and fall of the Brazilian Empire. This is the world at large, and we are Politics 1001. Politics 1001 The World at Love Mm-hmm. You know what, Josh? I always say every week that there's a lot going on in the world, but it seems like there's a lot going on in the world, particularly you know, in Serbia. Oh well, you know what, Ian? Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we? Oh, uh, I don't know. Maybe not. No, we're talking about it, Ian. Okay. Now, Serbia. Serbia, Serbia, Serbia. A country in the Balkans, southeastern Europe, known in history for the infamous war of the 1990s. Well, there's a lot going on there right now. So, Serbia, for a few days now, specifically four days, has been experiencing a large rise and spike in violent protesting. Especially so in the capital city of Belgrade. So, we're going to fast forward back to June 21st to understand why there's people a little bit angry right now. So, on June 21st, elections were held uh, for the president. And President Aleksandar Vucic of Serbia was able to win a lot of seats in the parliament. And, of course, was able to then secure his uh, win in the election. And he secured himself another term. And violence has erupted since Vucic won the election because he didn't do much uh, regarding a lockdown before the election, but started enforcing it after. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, And this is, and people are mad because, well, the coronavirus is going on. Right. And so once he held the elections and he won, Vucic began to strongly enforce the lockdown, subjecting Serbians to a strict curfew with threat of arrest should it be violated. And this has angered people since, well... There's a lot of rumor going around that, well, and there's some proof to back it up, that Vucic is consolidating his power. Before he took power, the president of Serbia was a primarily a constitutional position, so mm-hmm. it didn't have much power. But, right. now, but now that Vucic's been in power for a little bit, the president has actually become a lot more influential than it was supposed to be originally. And so people are saying, you just didn't lock down um, until the election happened because you didn't want it to look unpopular. And yeah. once you won the election, now you're enforcing this really strict lockdown. It's ridiculous. You obviously only just care about staying in power. Right. And so, although these protests were originally peaceful, the protests have quickly turned violent, uh, with police officers being assaulted with stones and other physical weapons. Jeez. Um, and you see this, around, especially in the parliamentary building, when hundreds of people um, tried to break into it and they attacked police. Really? And they, yeah, and there's a full-on riot going on. Yeah, it um, seems like it. Yeah, there's lots of fighting, lots of people got hurt, and 71 people were detained and got arrested. Um, this has infuriated the government. Um, Vucic said, why are you attacking my police? This is ridiculous. They work hard and they protect this country. You should not be doing that. And he's begun to crack down on these people by responding with violence. And Vucic was on a little bit of a diplomatic mission in France, I believe, and he was asked in an interview, are you afraid of losing power due to these political protests? Like, it seems like thousands of people kind of hate you. <laughs> and so Vucic said, oh, no, my main concern is, you know, not, uh, <laughs> yeah, my main concern is the coronavirus. He says his number one, the only thing that scares him are people dying from the coronavirus, mm-hmm. not losing power. And so his opposition has said, wow, you are just full of it, Mr. Vucic. Since when do you care about the coronavirus? You did not go on lockdown until after the election. This is just so showing and so telling for you. <laughs> And so you see all this <laughs> violence going on, which naturally is pissed off Vucic because yeah. he's pro-police because they protect him. And um, he said that this violence, he said that the people of Serbia actually support him. And what's happening is the people who are turning violent are just right-wing opposition to him that are being planted by the op- his op- the opposition to his political party. And they're people that are literally planted in there to stir trouble and make him seem like he's less popular than he is. Right. And so that's... Well, that's what he said is happening. Um, there's really no way to tell that if that's true or not. But it doesn't seem like there's a lot of trust going on. Yeah, like there's not a lot of trust because, again, the president is consolidating his power. He's far more powerful than he was. That's just a fact than he was like two years ago. Right. Um, this position has become a lot less ceremonial. Um, I see. Yeah. And so 
you do see this looming threat of coronavirus, and you do see an increase in cases going around the country. And the Serbian medical and the Serbian medical care is, of course, not the best in Europe by any chance, right? Or by any long shot. And so um, people are scared, and they don't want to get infected. But Vucic is saying, "Stop going in the streets. I'm enforcing this lockdown because now we're seeing a rise." When people are saying we're seeing a rise because, well, you let us go outside and do whatever we wanted before the election, and now we're facing the consequences. Mm. And so that's people's main reasoning for this. Um, but overall, people do believe this is a threat to Serbian democracy. President Vucic, like his opposition, believes that. People who are pro Vucic obviously do not think that. But right. the people who are against him are scared, and they do believe that Serbia is under threat of kind of going in a more Hungarian direction. Um, um, in which, you know, the president is just cracking down on everything and possibly limiting free speech. Um, Hence the reason for the protest. Yep. And mm-hmm. so, lots of fear going on. Lots of fear. We'll see what happens with Serbia. I mean, we don't really know. This fourth day of protests, and if it's anything like the United States, these protests could go on for months. Right. So, we don't really know what's going to end. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so... Just, I'm definitely yeah. curious to see where this goes, where this ends. Curiosity is good. Yeah. No, uh, you should also be curious about Ian. Uh, can I take a guess? <laughs> Absolutely. Is it uh, South Korea? You know what? It actually is. No way. <laughs> you got it right. So yeah. the mayor of South Korea, believe it or not, was, was found dead. Um, <laughs> so this is... Hmm. People are like, Sorry. why is he dead? And so there's no direct evidence as to why, because the family's trying to keep this very secret. But uh-huh. this is what we do now. A body was found dead in the rocky hills of Seoul, and Mayor Park Woon Soon had, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, I'm sorry if I'm not, but Park Woon Soon has supposedly committed suicide a day after one of his aides filed this, a complaint to the police regarding sexual assault. And this is a lot of controversy and a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, people, people not, are, people are angry about this yeah. and well, would be angry because Park right. Woon Soon is supposedly a woman's rights activist. Yes, um, in so which he, it tarnishes his reputation. Yeah, and and since he was found dead a day after this was reported, a lot of people think this is why. And uh, apparently there was a suicide note there in which it said, okay. unquote, I send my apologies to everyone. I thank everyone who shared my life. I am so sorry to my family to whom I only gave pain. Mm. So that's a pretty that's grim really message. Sad. Pretty grim message. Yeah. So it seems like he Jeez. definitely did something wrong. Um, however, again, the police will not release the report. Specifically, the Seoul Police Department did release this statement, end quote. Currently, we've found no evidence to support murder, but we will nevertheless conduct a thorough investigation into his death. Considering the honor of the mayor and his bereaved family, we are not going to disclose the cause of the death. Mm-hmm. So they don't know the cause of the death, but they're not going to disclose it when we find it. Obviously, this note being there is a pretty big indication that it was suicide, and so there's a lot of suspicion regarding that, that maybe he actually was sexually assaulting people, despite the fact that, again, he was a very big human rights activist, or woman's rights right. activist, rather. Right. That's a tough situation for the family, and... Yeah. These are possible victims, too, as well. Yeah. And Mayor Wansun is considered, well, he was being considered for a possible presidential candidate in 2022 in the next South Korean election. Uh-oh. He was very, very powerful and a very well-liked figure within his, right. within the South Korean community. Um, like that just all went down the drain. Like, this man was very powerful and he just kind of committed suicide. I and wonder no one if saw he had coming. a history of depression and whatnot. Possibly. Like, the family is very discreet about this. Right. Um, which makes sense, because he just died. Yeah. But also, he's a public figure, so you would think they would reveal more. Yeah. In my opinion. Maybe. I, I don't know. I do not know South Korean politics. I do not either. <laughs> to know if, you know, you have to t- uh, report that stuff or not. Right. In the U.S., obviously, it's a lot more open. Right. Regarding if you have a mental illness or not. Um, but anyways, we're going to move on to a rather large Nigerian scam. Mm. <laughs> Nigeria is infamous for having their scammers going everywhere. Right. And not all Nigerians are scammers. We're not saying that. But there are a lot of Nigerian scammers. This is a hotbed of, of scam organizations. Yes. Sure. And so we're going to be talking about Mr. Ramon Oloruna Abbas. And mm-hmm. he's known today by his 2.5 million Instagram follower base is Ray Hush Puppy. <laughs> and he has been seized by <laughs> Dubai police. I'm going to be honest. I have no idea who this person is, but apparently he's really famous. Um, right. he, there's a lot of pictures of him um, on like private jets in Dubai. You know, he has his arms around a lot of girls, and he's really he's a chill, he's a relaxed person, really successful and wealthy. Except the question is, he was not wealthy growing up. Where did he get all this money? And so, mm. um, you know, this has obviously been a big question. 
And eventually he was tracked down to his apartment in Dubai when he posted a picture of himself in Dubai. Um, <laughs> and so Dubai police tracked him down because apparently um, he was smug. He had committed a huge scam that was worth over 350 million British pounds. Um, wow. Yeah, a lot. And this is mostly through uh, law firms. It is, it is his main primary source of money. He managed to reroute bank transfers to himself. <laughs> and right. so, yeah, a pretty successful scammer, honestly. But when his apartment was stormed in Dubai, they found over 30 million pounds of cash just sitting there. Yeah, so, Probably waiting for their, that to be laundered. Probably. Imagine. That's a lot of cash. Yeah. <laughs> just, I oh, don't crazy. think I've ever seen more than like $1,000 of cash, maybe, just sitting yeah. around. Like, that's crazy. At the U.S. Mint, they have a box of a million dollars in cash hmm. for tourists to see. So I have seen that. Other than that, where is that? The U.S. Mint. Oh, oh, the U.S. Mint. No, I thought you said you just saw a box. Oh, I didn't hear the U.S. Mint part. No. Oh. All right, cool. Well, go check that out, guys. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, his lawyer, um, Mr. Hush Puppy's lawyer, has said that um, he this is ridiculous because. Um, He's being extradited to the United States for trial for criminal charges, except he's not a U.S. citizen. And so Hush Puppy's lawyer is like, well, why are you doing this? He's not a U.S. citizen. He shouldn't be put on trial in the United States. Um, and so that's kind of what's going on there. Obviously, this is a pretty big scam. Some people yeah. need to watch out for that. If you ever hear someone asking for your money, you should definitely right. be careful. Yep. A little bit of a warning from Politics 1001. Yeah. Never give them access to your computer. Especially if his name is Hush Puppy. You should be <laughs> If their name is Hush Puppy, we're not saying all Hush Puppies are <laughs> scammers, but we are saying to yeah. proceed with caution. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. so well, that's all with Nigeria. So we're going to go over to France. Really sad case in France. So this guy has a French name. I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, but I'm, his name is Felipe Mangul. <laughs> and he's a bus driver in the southern... Sort of the end. He's laughing at me. And so um, he was a bus driver and he was in the southern city, French city of Bayonet. And he was beaten by a few passengers after he politely asked them to wear masks. Well, do not wear a mask. And so they then proceeded to beat him up and like, really, really beat him up. He ended up being pronounced brain dead, which is pretty much dead. Right. And so he was 59, I believe. And yeah, they, they beat him up because they didn't want to wear masks. Um, presumably, people. Uh, on the right wing. We don't really know. Um, but two men have been charged with murder, and the French government called this a cowardly act, and that's, quote, cowardly. And they called this disgusting, and how it should not happen ever again, and how no. you just need to wear your mask. Yeah. That and, is very sad. Yeah. It, it definitely is. Yeah. Well, hopefully. Hopefully. The family is very sad, obviously. Obviously. And I'll move on. I mean, it's a that, lesson for everyone. Yeah. It's definitely representative of the overall anger the world is having with masks and all these lockdowns. And people are obviously getting fed up with yeah. this. Um, not that these people are in any way justified. Obviously, yeah. they were not. Uh, yeah, but they probably but they probably had months of anger built up in them. Right. Um, it does seem like the coronavirus vaccine is less and less likely as the virus continues to mutate. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh, a lot of people are starting to think that it's not really necessary. We're just going to have to live with this. But, However, you shouldn't beat someone up. You should not beat up a bus driver for thinking no, that. We, so. sen we send our condolences to the family. Politics 1001. Mm -hmm. it, it's a pretty hefty message. We are very influential, obviously. Yes. And so <laughs> and so we're going to go over to Idlib in, in Syria. And Idlib is a, north, is a province in northeastern Syria. If you remember um, about last year, after all this drama that we've gone through, Idlib was the province that Turkey originally invaded after the U.S. pulled out, um, it pulled out of Syria and left the Kurdish the Kurdish army to defend itself. And so Turkey invaded and pretty much bombed everything. And under the with the justification of we need to get rid of the PKK Workers Party, which the uh, Turkey and the U.S. recognized as a terrorist group, so they bombed them and they slaughtered them. And um, Kurd the Kurdish people reached out to. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad for help. But anyways, the province was bombed, and it, it was kind of a wreck. And now, the first coronavirus case has been seen in Idlib. That's fair. So this has spread a lot of fear around the province because, well, the medical facilities are not exactly high-functioning right now. They used to be, but they're kind of struggling. Right. And so this 
uh, like I said, has scared a lot of people and definitely scared the Syrian government because it's kind of their responsibility to help them. Right. And so, yeah, you don't you don't want to be seeing new cases of coronavirus popping up right now. Like, no. At this point, it's supposed to be kind of fading off and flatlining, but this is the first case, which probably ind- indicates that there's many to come. Wow. So, that is all our news today. Yes, it is. But we still have more to get to after I do a quick little shout out to our friends over at Quick Daily News Daily. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really enjoy listening. I know Josh does too, and they analyze the news in under 20 minutes, and they're authentic, human, and humorous, or so they hope, Uh, (laughs) but they're really concise, and we'll link them in our description, but you should check them out, because they're definitely worth listening to if you want to be informed in under 20 minutes. Yep, and this guy's very young. He's a college student. Yep. So, yeah, check him out. Do it. All right, so now we're going to move on to our historical topic of today. And yes, that we are. Is the Brazilian Empire. <gasps> Brazil had a monarchy. Oh, my no God. Um, uh, a lot of people didn't know Hawaii had a monarchy, so I don't know if you knew Brazil had a monarchy either. I found this very interesting when I first found this out. Um, but they did, and it was very short-lived. In fact, it was, let's see, if I do my math right, it was about 67 years, I think. Yeah, 67 years, 1822 to 1889. You can correct me if I'm wrong. That is a very, very short time for a monarchy to exist. Yeah. Um, the monarchy essentially existed as a transition period between the Portuguese independence and the modern-day Brazilian Republic that we see now. And so what happened is Prince Pedro, who was originally under the Portuguese crown, um, had learned that Portugal had annulled his remaining powers. And he was not very happy about that. And so this is kind of where Brazil declared its independence. We're going to just talk about the empire itself. And so he said in a very emotional speech, his first, like, most emotional one, he said, armbands off, soldiers. Hail to independence, to freedom, and to the separation of Brazil. He said this to his troops. He unsheathed the sword. He took the Portuguese sash he had around his body. He ripped it off and threw it on the ground. And he said, for my blood, my honor, my God, I swear to give Brazil freedom, independence, or death. And with that... (laughs) <laughs> very dramatic as a result declared their independence uh, Mel Gibson so, in uh, Braveheart has nothing on that speech mm-hmm. <laughs> okay I haven't <laughs> okay so Prince Pedro would eventually become Emperor Pedro of the first Emperor of Brazil but he on this this was set on September 7th 1822 so this is when the Brazilian Empire technically declared independence but it would take him a few years to actually get it because Portugal was like Mm-mm, you're not doing that and so, <laughs> and so they immediately deployed troops all around Brazil and Portuguese loyalists clashed with the troops loyal to Pedro, and they fought mercilessly all over the country. Though eventually, on March 8th, 1824, the last troops of the Portuguese crown surrendered. It took over a year, so this, so they surrendered on March 8th, 1824, but it took until August 29th, 1825, for Portugal to officially recognize Brazil as a sovereign nation. And so now you have Brazil. It's not a republic as we see today, it's just an empire ruled by, well, Pedro I. However, there was a lot of internal struggle. So you see different struggles between different political parties in the Brazilian cabinet appointed by Pedro. And this was led by, at first, by José Bonifacio de Andrada. And he openly wanted to abolish slavery and he wanted a central, and he wanted a centralized government around a constitutional monarchy. And so a lot of people were, most people were actually in favor of the monarchy, but it was how did we want the monarchy? Do we want an absolute one, a constitutional one, or a constitutional one that was not centralized? So all these mm-hmm. different political parties clash, and obviously these are very different things. Right. And so Bonifacio, um, because he wanted to... So there was a party called the Absolutists, and they were a party um, primarily of Portuguese descendants. So like they literally were born in Portugal, or their parents were Portuguese, and they wanted to... And after, they declared, after Brazil declared their independence, they were kind of stuck. And so they had their own party called the Absolutists. They wanted an absolute monarchy um, that ruled over them. And so... Bonifacio was not a fan of that because, again, he led a different party that did not want that. So we passed two bills restricting the rights of of Portuguese citizens, which severely upset the absolutist party. And this was actually very unpopular because Bonifacio not only passed that, but again, he was very anti-slavery, which was really unpopular in Brazil. Um, And so Bonifacio was pretty much forced to resign. And so Emperor Pedro II... uh, kicked him out, and he reorganized the cabinet due to Bonifacio's unpopularity. 
and he appointed another pro-constitutional monarchy political party to head of the cabinet. But nevertheless, we got to have a civil war. And so civil war broke out in 1826 between Emperor Pedro and the liberal opposition. Um, and the liberal opposition prioritized a more autonomous way of governance in which less power would be resided in the federal government, similar to that of the United States today. Right. And so during that war, a territory known as Cisplantina in 1828 was lost and it declared independence as a modern day Republic of Uruguay. Hmm. So naturally, the war didn't go too well for them. And so this went on for a while. Pedro I had a pretty short reign. He was more concerned with Portuguese politics to fight the fact that he declared independence from them. Because his daughter still had a claim to the Portuguese throne, but the Portuguese government was like, you declare independence, you no longer have any legitimacy on our throne. But he was right. like, no, I want it anyways. And so he resigned. And he and his daughter went to Europe to reclaim the throne of Lisbon. And so they left. And so, naturally, because of that, we're going to have Pedro II, his son, his oldest son, I believe, take over as monarch. However, slight little misfault, his son was six. So, <laughs> so he kind of ditched yeah. his son, uh, who was six years old, and so the uh, Pedro the Second took over as monarch. But he was he had a regency council running over him for twelve years yeah. until he was eighteen and ready to actually take over the throne. Right. And during that, there was even more political clashing. Uh, we're not going to go into that too much because it's just so complicated. But every yeah. single party again was residing for power in this. I want an absolute monarchy. I want a constitutional monarchy, but I do not want the constitutional monarchy to have that much power in a central government. But I want a constitutional monarchy that has power in the central government. It was it was very bad, and a lot of people died, and a lot of civil war. But then Pedro II took over at 18, and he was actually known a lot as a very good emperor. In 1845, uh, civil war pretty much ended in Brazil. He put a stop to it. He put down everyone. Granted, there were thousands of dead people everywhere. But Civil War did stop, so maybe just brutally putting down the suppression saved more lives? I don't know. That's a big debate between historians. Um, but he was well-respected as a competent monarch who was dedicated to his job. We're going to go into as to why. So in 1850, however, Pedro II, although emperor, was very, very passionate about continuing the Brazilian monarchy. My dad was a monarch. I want my son to be a monarch. He was very into this until in 1850 when his last male heir died. And so at that point, many historians believe that from there on out, Pedro's want for the monarchy to continue after his death kind of started to fade away. Um, he wasn't very passionate about it. He didn't um, have a legacy. Like, uh, why? This is ridiculous. I need to just keep having kids until I have an heir. Um, and right. so he definitely was very pro-transition in some respects. Um, and we'll see this later. But Pedro's reforms over Brazil were considered some of the most successful in, uh, in modern history in such a short time span. Um, the Brazilian Navy at the height of Brazilian Empire, which was literally the last three years, was the height of Brazil, uh, believe it or not. Um, it was Brazilian Navy was considered, considered to be the third most powerful in the world after the UK and the United States, um, which is very impressive considering Brazil literally declared independence like 50 years prior. Right. And they had a flourishing economy, which was similar to Western Europe. It had pretty similar standards of living to Western Europe. And it was a very diverse nation. Um, Pedro II was a very big activist for for women's rights. You see, he allowed women's rights movements to exist, and there was a lot of freedom of speech and freedom of press, and this was internationally admired. Brazil was for their freedom standards by France, by the UK, by the United States. Like, it was very impressive. Hmm. However, Pedro II, throughout his reign, started to get a little bit old. You know, he was not feeling too good. As it happens. He had a bad diet, and so he started to not feel as healthy. And so... In 1887, two years prior to the fall of the monarchy, he departed for Europe due to poor health conditions. And so, but what's interesting is on his way out of Europe, he was praised from the civilians for applause. Like thousands of people surrounded him and they were clapping and they were like, Viva Brazil! And they were, they were shouting and screaming and they were they just big, big fans of, big fans of Pedro II. Right. He was a very popular monarch. According to many people who visited Brazil at the time, they said that they've never seen a monarch so popular with the people. Um, because wow. in his later years, uh, Pedro II was known to stay up for hours and hours after work when he was younger and just read and read and pass stuff and work really hard. But as he got older, he stopped doing that as much. In his later years, he stopped not wanting to be emperor as much. And instead, he took walks in the streets. He went to local markets and restaurants and because he just wanted to get down with the people. He just wanted a life of a normal citizen to be a normal citizen. He even said after he retired, he wanted to go live in Europe on a farm or something like that. But he just wanted to be a frugal man. And he even abolished hand kissing ritual. He thought it was stupid. Um, he, he's like, I, he he didn't want to, he didn't want to be 
you know, this regal person. Right. And this was, well, so this was actually not very popular in the aristocracy because they thought it took away from the prestige of a monarchy. Well, yeah. Pedro just didn't want people kissing his hand. He thought it was kind of inconvenient and annoying. And so, yeah. um, nevertheless, I mean, hand kissing there. And so, yeah. as we know with coronavirus. Yeah, maybe that, maybe it started in Brazil. And so, and so <laughs> no, no, that was no. a joke. <laughs> um, and so upon their return to Brazil, upon his return, tens of thousands of people again crowded the streets and not only in the capital, but all over the country. It was everywhere, even though even if he didn't visit it, it was, it was it's pretty crazy. And yeah, and so because of that, Pedro was obviously very popular. So there's opposition, the Republicans who wanted to establish a republic similar to the U.S. As we know today, Brazil has a very similar system to the United States with, you know, with senators and such. But the Republicans want, who are very anti-modern wanted to get rid of Pedro, but this would obviously prove difficult because he was a very popular person. Although they took advantage of his declining health, and they knew that this guy was very chilled down to earth, and he really didn't want to put up a fight. And so they slowly encroached on the emperor's power, and they managed to take over the country and declare the nation's independence or a new rebirth away from the monarchy by taking advantage of the emperor's weak health. And they campaigned, they had the support of the military, they had the support of the uh, nobility, because or the aristocracy because he wanted because Pedro was not a big fan of slavery he thought it was immoral and he didn't he was not an abolitionist by any means but he just didn't like it right. um, he didn't really speak about it but just the thought of not liking slavery and eventually you know getting rid of it is what caused people to just be really really angry and the Republicans they literally laid siege to his palace and they or they they laid siege to places around the country Pedro himself upon hearing of the news of the parliamentary building and such being taken. He was told, you have 24 hours to go into exile. The Republic is, the monarchy has been abolished. And Pedro originally was very hesitant to this because he didn't just want to ditch his citizens. But mm -hmm. um, after a group of students loyal to the Republic attacked his Imperial Guard force um, in the southern, southern part of the country he currently was staying. And after that, he agreed to leave. So Pedro left. He, he was very, um, he didn't fight it. He wasn't, again, he wasn't the biggest fan of the monarchy to begin with. Obviously, it was constitutional. And so he agreed to go. But what's interesting was uh, his final words on his deathbed. He didn't suffer any pain were, uh, may God grant me these last wishes, peace and prosperity for Brazil. Mm -hmm. Those are his last words of Pedro. And he's been known to say stuff like that um, throughout his reign. He's very, very down to earth type of person. Yeah. And so he died in Paris because um, he was overseas for medical attention. Mm -hmm. The monarchy was abolished. So he was in exile. It was abolished in 1889, but this is 1891 when he died. And yeah, his last wish was just, I want Brazil to be a nice place. Oh, that's yeah. sweet. So with that, that's a little bit of a summary into Brazil. Yes, it is. Hope you enjoy that story. It always makes me sad. It always makes me sad. <laughs> it seems like, it's from what I've seen, it seems like Brazil, uh, Pedro II was a pretty decent monarch. Mm -hmm. um, he was enormously powerful. He had a lot of power. And, um, he was very he was very into science. He traveled everywhere and he brought back scientific findings. He would stay up late and read scientific magazines. He was very into innovation. He built the longest railway in all of Latin America. Wow. And so a lot of these reforms were for the Brazilian people. And this mm -hmm. is what made him very popular. Because there's stuff at the same time, like going into World War One in Russia, the Russian monarchy, there was one railroad in like the entire country, uh, rumor has it, that went from the Tsar's winter palace to his summer palace. <laughs> and so um, you see right. the, quite the distinction there and that Pedro actually built railroads for the people and he was a very man of science and he brought people from all over the world to come to Brazil and do research and he funded it yeah. um, Brazil was a very it had a, lots of economic growth again it's very very similar it was like the eighth most populous country in the world so it was considered actually a very powerful nation definitely the most powerful in South America I'm going to be honest I didn't know anything about this Yes. Yeah. Thank so, you for enlightening me. Yeah, so yeah, it's very interesting. But with that, guys, we are going to be wrapping this up. Yes, we, we are. We hope you enjoyed this. So we know you enjoyed oh, it. Oh, we know you did. <laughs> so please, please, please subscribe. Subscribe. If you're listening on Apple, subscribe there. If you're listening on YouTube, subscribe there. Hit that little bell. Mm -hmm. If you're listening on Spotify, what are you gonna do? I would say subscribe. Maybe tell your friends. Maybe tell your friends. Mm, yeah. Maybe tell strangers. Maybe share it. Yeah, if you're on that subway and you and you are sharing your seat next to some senior yeah. or just some other guy that's your age or woman, 
You can tell them about Politics 1001. Be like, hey, you ever heard about this show? It's a really good conversation starter. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's, it's so, um, yeah, with that, guys, thank you for listening. Um, we hope you have a great day. Uh, we'll see you later. Goodbye. <laughs>